Um, my talk will be the complete opposite of Antonis. This is sorry to your to your computational analysis people. Thank you. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm really excited to share with you today the work that we've been doing recently in the Gomerman lab using IMC to image multiple sclerosis and uh, some da data from a paper we recently published showing uh, the first use of IMC to visualize MS lesions. So I'd like to start by giving you a little bit of background into what we're interested in. So what exactly is multiple sclerosis? What is this disease? So MS is a chronic autoimmune disease in which the body's immune cells will infiltrate the central nervous system and demyelinate neurons. So myelin is this um, protein here. It's pointed out by the black arrow. Well, it's not really a protein. It's mostly fat. But essentially, it protects the axons of neurons. And not only does it protect, it allows neurons to communicate fast and uh, effectively with each other. So when neurons become demyelinated, this communication is affected, and you end up with this, uh, common symptoms of MS, things like uh, um, fatigue, muscle spasticity, uh, blurred vision, hearing problems. Eventually, patients will have trouble walking and become wheelchair-bound. The disease is quite prominent, especially in uh, North America and in Nordic countries. And we don't know what the underlying cause is, but we do know that there are both genetic and environmental factors at play. There also seems to be a gender bias. Women are about three times more likely to be diagnosed with MS than men are. But what makes this disease most interesting for us as people who study it is the massive heterogeneity we see. MS is heterogeneous not only in clinical symptoms, but in the general pathology as well. And so what is this pathology? What does MS look like? So when a patient comes to the hospital showing symptoms of MS, one of the first things that's done to help diagnose them is an MRI. So here what you're looking at is the MRI of a healthy brain compared to the MRI of someone with MS. And you can already see that the brain shows a lot of physical differences during MS, but what I want you to really focus on are these white spots that you see in the deep white matter tissue. And what these are are the actual lesions. These are areas where myelin has been stripped away and, and myelin is missing. This is what an actual lesion looks like. And so let's say a patient decides that uh, once you know the disease progresses and eventually they will pass away, and let's say they, they decide to donate their brain to science. And so when this happens, we can actually do an autopsy and look at these sections, uh, take a section of this part of the brain, stain it, and get a better look at what these white spots look like. And here's what that looks like. So this is a section of an MS brain stained for myelin. And myelin, in this case, is blue. And you can see uh, we already start to see different types of lesions just by looking at the myelin alone. So here you can see lesions next to ventricles. We have this more circular lesion, which is probably surrounding a blood vessel. And you can actually see lesions that follow the uh, myelin fibers or tracts. And here, these slightly darker spots are what we call shadow plaques. These are areas where the brain was demyelinated, but it attempted to fix the problem and remyelinate itself. And this is something we see uh, pretty commonly in the beginning of disease. But I'm sure you can imagine myelin alone isn't enough to tell us about what's going on during MS. And here's a great example of that. So here you're looking at three different lesions, and they're all just stained for myelin. Myelin is brown in this case. And you can see just by looking at the myelin, the staining patterns are almost identical. If we just looked at these three pictures, we wouldn't really be able to say that these are three different lesions. But when we look at the cells in these different areas, you really start to see the differences. So if we look at our resident myeloid cells with CD68, you can see that in the first lesion, CD68 positive cells are found all throughout the tissue area. And so what that tells us is that lesion one is now an active lesion. In lesion two, we see that the cells are concentrated around this rim or edge of the lesion. And so what that tells us now is that lesion two becomes a mixed active inactive lesion. And in lesion three, when we look at the cells, you see we don't find any CD68 positive cells at all in the area. So what that tells us is that lesion three is an inactive lesion. And not only is there heterogeneity in terms of lesion activity, and these aren't the only three types. There are lots of different types of lesions, but these are the three main ones. We also see different type uh, patterns of demyelination. So a lesion could be T cell mediated, apoptosis mediated, complement mediated, or antibody mediated. And there's still some controversy about this in the field, uh, depending on you know which school you subscribe to, because pathology is just a, a snapshot in time, right? So how do we really know that these are four different patterns of demyelination and not that we're just catching one stage of the same pattern? 
And if, as if that wasn't enough heterogeneity with MS, we not only see white matter lesions, but gray matter lesions as well. So here what you're looking at is myelin-stained brain tissue. Again, myelin is brown. And you see in the normal case, myelin in the gray, or the gray matter is a little less myelinated than the white matter. And that's just normal healthy brain tissue. But in the MS brain, you see that we have a white matter lesion, but you also see that the gray matter is completely missing myelin. And if we zoom in a little bit, you can see this even better, where in the normal brain, gray matter is a little less myelinated, but it's still there. And in the MS brain, myelin is completely gone. This is really important to us because one, my, um, this gray matter demyelination is specific to MS. We don't see it in any other neurodegenerative diseases. And we also know that gray matter demyelination is associated with clinical disability. So what does that mean? How does the pathology relate to clinical disability? So when you look at MS, the disease can really be split into these different phases of the disease, where early in the disease, it's characterized by this relapse remitting course. You have bouts of demyelination associated with increased clinical disability, followed by bouts of remyelination and less uh, clinical disability. And the demyelination in this case is mainly those local white matter lesions. But as the disease progresses, and most patients will progress, about 80% do progress, you see not only those white matter lesions, but general gray matter lesions as well, cortical pathology, brain atrophy, and a loss of brain volume. And this is really important to us because we know that in the early phases of the disease, immune modulatory therapies have the potential to be effective. But once patients reach this progressive disease, the therapies are no longer helpful. And so the question really is, what's going on in, these, uh, in this progressive phase of the disease? What's causing these gray matter lesions? And eventually, if we can figure that out, we can hopefully come up with therapies that would target uh, specifically those um, causes. So one of the theories or ideas for what causes these gray matter lesions is that the meninges are involved. So the idea is that with MS, we see general meningeal inflammation, and we also see these uh, immune cell aggregates here. And these actually look like tertiary lymphoid organs, interestingly. Um, and the presence of these immune cell aggregates plus meningeal inflammation is really closely associated with um, cortical demyelination, so gray matter pathology. And when we look a little closer at these immune cell aggregates with H&E and IF, you can see that we see the presence of B cells, T cells, uh, plasma cells. And this is actually one of the papers that, um, this image is from one of the papers that was able to look at this most uh, closely, with most detail. And as you can see, it's really not a lot of detail at all. They see the presence of these cells, but that doesn't really tell us anything about what the cells are doing. And so this is where IMC becomes really important to us because it's not enough for us to know that the cells are there. We need to know what their phenotype is, which antibody isotypes they're expressing, which cytokines they produce, and most importantly, how their presence and function relates to what's happening in the gray matter. So how do we do this? We did a pilot study using white matter lesions. So um, I'm sure you're all asking yourselves, you're interested in gray matter, why are you doing a pilot study using white matter? So a few different reasons. One, uh, gray matter is generally difficult to stain, and it's also not as myelinated as white matter, just naturally. So I'm sure you can understand this would skew our results if we did a pilot study using a difficult tissue. We also know that inflammation in the gray matter is just uh, sparse compared to the white matter, and so of course this wouldn't be a, pos a good positive control for a pilot study. And we also needed to ensure that our technique was, uh, was working really well first before applying it to the gray matter. And all of the data I'm about to show you was published in August 2019 uh, in eLife. So if you're looking for more detail and of course more images, uh, please check that paper out, as well as Dr. Uh, David Pitt's paper from Yale, uh, who, which nicely mirrors what we were able to do. So what was the tissue we used for this pilot study? So this tissue came from a young woman who was diagnosed with MS and was placed on a treatment of monoclonal antibodies. But eventually what happened is that her um, she became seropositive for the JC virus. And so when that happens, they have to take you off of the treatment. And once she was taken off the treatment, she had a huge uh, immune reaction and um, just very quickly afterwards, unfortunately, passed away. Um, and But since the tissue was very active and when she died, the disease was a very active version of the disease, uh, this was a great positive control tissue for us. 
So here's some of the initial histology work that was done with this tissue. Uh, this is all courtesy of Dr. Alexander Pratt from University of Montreal. And um, I don't want you to focus on all these images, but just generally you can see with the histology already, here we're looking at myelin, so you can already start to see lesions. Here we're looking at uh, complement, we can see evidence of complement activation. You can see plasma, uh, evidence of antibodies uh, in plasma cells, T cells, B cells, and of course our blood vessels. Okay, so what we did was we had uh, serial sections of this tissue. We stained one of the slides by IF for uh, PLP, which stains myelin, and myelin here is red, so blue to brown to red, now myelin is red. And you can see that um, each of these squares, so what we did was we picked an ROI that was representative of the different lesion types that we were interested in. And here's a list of those lesion types. So each one of these um, squares will correspond to one of these lesion types. So once we figured out which areas would be most representative, we then stained the serial slide by IMC, which of course I don't have to explain, and uh, then looked at each of these um, ROIs. Here's the panel we use. So of course we have myel PLP for myelin, we have our myeloid cell markers, plasma and B cell markers, T cell markers, our uh, activation and inflammation markers, as well as collagen for blood vessels. And um, just a general summary of our data processing. So uh, we just uh, started by using MCD Viewer to mainly threshold and gamma correct all of our images, just to make sure that everything was starting on the same playing field. We then used Cell Profiler for despeckling and uh, Image J for creating composite images. So the first question we had to ask was, is our IMC signal equivalent to what we ha already have by IF? And so here what you're looking at is um, the same area of that uh, of the uh, brain tissue we were looking at, stained here by immunofluorescence and here by IMC. And you can see that just if we're looking at just the cells alone with DAPI and intercalator, you can see that, uh, that we already see a almost pretty much the identical staining pattern. So this tells us it's pretty equivalent. And when we look more specifically uh, at a particular cell type, so let's say T cells with CD3, you can see that we uh, do see the same cells as well as the same staining pattern. So this tells us or indicates to us that uh, our IMC signal can be trusted because it looks like what our IF signal looks like. So the next question we had to ask was, is our IMC signal specific? And here you're looking at the same uh, brain tissue you were just looking at. Here we have B cells indicated by Ig kappa, microglia or macrophage, we can't tell them apart yet, uh, characterized by CD68, and T cells uh, by CD3. And if we look specifically at B cells, you can see just how specific our signal is. So of course we know that uh, B cells, because of allelic exclusion, will be either Ig kappa positive or Ig lambda positive, and shouldn't be double positive. And so here, if we turn on just the Ig kappa channel, we see there's no B cell found in the square here. But when we turn on Ig lambda, that B cell suddenly pops up. And if we look down here on the opposite end, when we turn on Ig kappa, we find a B cell there. And when we turn on Ig lambda, that B cell now disappears. So that really tells us that our staining is equivalent, number one, to IF. And number two is staining specifically the cell types we're interested in. Here you're looking at myelin. So we have our normal appearing white matter. So when I say normal appearing white matter, it's an area of the MS brain tissue that theoretically should not have a lesion there yet. So it's not in the control brain. It was still looking in the MS brain. And here in the normal appearing white matter, it should look like the control uh, brain where myelin is just found all over the tissue. And that's what we find here, myelin is everywhere. Compare that to the active lesion where myelin is almost completely gone. And what's interesting here actually is that um, this myelin that kind of looks like spots, uh, when we overlap that with our phagocytic cells, we can actually find that um, they do overlap. So this shows us that it's myelin that's actually inside a cell that's just eaten it up. Here we're looking at our microglia and macrophages. So here we see in the normal appearing white matter, we do find some HLA positive cells, although they're most likely microglia, which I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, and this is normal because of course microglia are a tissue resident. But in the active lesion, HLA positive cells are found all throughout the tissue, consisting of both microglia and macrophages, which I'll show you in a bit. Here now separating between them. So TMEM119 is a marker specific to microglia. So when we look at the normal tissue, we want to see mostly yellow cells, right? Cells that are double positive for TMEM and HLA. And that's what we find here. Compared to the active lesion, where we do see some microglia, but also a lot of HLA single positive cells, which are macrophages, and show that immune cell infiltration has happened in this brain. 
Here we're looking at T cells. So in a, a normal brain, of course, you shouldn't find T cells, right? It shouldn't be immune cell infiltration. But when we look at the, so when we look at the normal appearing white matter, we don't find any T cells, which is perfect. Compared to the active lesion, where we see CD8 positive T cells and CD8 negative T cells. So it tells us immune cell infiltration has happened in this person's brain. So that was a, a nice summary of the qualitative analysis we were able to do with this paper. But of course, um, for more images, take a look at the actual paper. Um, but we also were interested in what kind of quantitative analysis could be done uh, in terms of looking at um, MS using IMC. So with this, we really collaborated with uh, Dr. Trevor McKee and Fred Fu from the Star Institute. And with their help, what we were able to do was use a combination of Definians and Jupiter. Definians for mainly segmenting, despeckling, and manual selection. And then Jupiter to create 2D plots and heat maps that were representative of our data. So here's a, a really quick example of that. So here we're looking at just T cells. So what we did was we manually selected T cells based on biologically relevant markers. So just us with Trevor sitting in front of a computer clicking cells. Um, and we used that to create gates for what we considered positive for CD8, CD4, and CD3. We then applied those gates to all of our T cells uh, that weren't manually selected, but of course still based on biologically relevant markers. So there was some positive and negative selection that occurred beforehand. And you can see we saw, we saw really nice separation of our uh, CD8 positive T cells, CD4, and our double negative cells over here. We were also able to create these heat maps for cell density and distance from blood vessels. But here you're just looking at the density one. Uh, of course, I don't want you to look at all of this, but if we focus on T cells, you can see that in the normal appearing white matter, the density of T cells is quite low, which of course is expected. But in the active lesion, that goes up. And, compared, and uh, th we see a similar pattern with our CD4 positive T cell population as well. And so in conclusion, we were able to show that IMC can be used in the MS brain for both qualitative and quantitative analysis, and that uh, the signal is um, actually quite equivalent to the techniques that we more commonly use, like IF and h &E. And what we're really excited about doing now is actually applying everything we've learned from this pilot study to our gray matter lesion uh, and our gray matter tissue, and trying to understand how the meninges uh, and meningeal inflammation relate to gray matter uh, pathology. And of course, you can understand why IMC would be so useful in this case, because we need a technique that allows us to look at, um, all, to answer all of these questions. We're asking a lot of questions at the same time, while also maintaining that spatial context, because we're trying to understand, right, the meninges, how they relate to the cortex right underneath them. We also need well-characterized human samples. All of our controls come from the Netherlands Brain Bank, and we need both non-neurological controls, so from patients who have died from something like a heart attack, as well as inflammatory controls. So this would be something like encephalitis, where you have inflammation of the brain, but without immune cell infiltration. And most importantly, we need a way to stratify our samples so that we're looking at only those patients that have this meningeal inflammation, because not all patients do. And so this is a little bit of unpublished data I'm showing now, but what we think is that our knowledge of white matter lesions will be able to help us predict which patients have, those gray uh, have that meningeal inflammation. So what we did here was we stained uh, brain tissue for myelin. Myelin is brown again here. And we found areas of gray matter lesions, like this one here, and an area of normal appearing gray matter down here. Then what we did was quantify the immune cells in the meninges. So you can see meninges next to each of these areas. So we quantified the immune cells in the meninges next to each of these areas, and then stratified those samples based on their white matter lesion activity. And what we found was that there were more immune cells in the meninges next to gray matter lesions, but only in those patients that had mixed active and active white matter lesions. And so what that tells us is that if we understand the white matter lesion activity, we can predict which patients would have this meningeal inflammation and uh, predict the best samples for studying, for using IMC uh, to further study MS. So a big thank you to everybody in, the, uh, you know, for Fluidine for having us and um, to everybody in the Gomerman Lab, just the most amazing group, uh, especially Dr. Uh, Jennifer Gomerman, Valeria, and Olga, uh, as well as Karen, who did a lot of um, base work on this project. Thank you.